founding chairman of the Association of the Citizens Against Corruption. His efforts and exemplary contribution to justice have been recognized by the International Commission of Justice, Kenya, and the Lords of Society of Kenya. He received numerous honors, including runner-up for the Martin Luther King Dino Leadership Award in 1998, the director of McKinney Schools, Nairobi, recognized for community service by the American Biological Institute. He also received the 2008 Martin Luther King Africa Salute to Greatness Award by the Martin Luther King Dino Africa Foundation. <laughs> he is the distinguished Mali Munyarele Lecturer for 2014. PLO Lumumba served as the 11th Kwame Nkrumah Lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana in 2016. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these are but a few lines to introduce Professor Lumumba. His passion is deeply rooted in the faith and direction of the African continent and has also given lectures on a broad range of themes concerning Africa's developmental trajectory, from democracy to foreign aid to corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor and privilege that I present to this august body, this erudite scholar, this industrious son of this African, this great African continent, to present a talk on youth empowerment and good governance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor P.L.O. Lumumba. Thank you very much. Let, let me start by recognizing the organizers of this occasion. Those who are resident here in the Gambia and those who are resident outside of the Gambia in what we refer to as the diaspora. Let me also recognize the platform guests who are present here this evening and the men and women who have graced this occasion. I am acutely aware that I am supposed to share my thoughts with you on the subject of youth empowerment in Africa. But the Honorable Jata made a presentation that deserves scrutiny as a preface to my presentation. He said that Africa is a paradox. If he were a psychiatrist, he would say that Africa is schizophrenic. There is a sense in which Africa presents multiple personalities. Begging the question, is there one Africa or there are many Africans? When the European powers sat in Berlin in 1884, they parceled out Africa amongst themselves. The Germans had their peace, as did the French, as did the British, as did the Spaniards, the Portuguese, and of course the Belgians. And boundaries were drawn a bit rarely. Today, of course, we have 55 countries, assuming that Morocco does not object to the Republic of Sahrawi, in which event we'll say they are 54, but I prefer to say that they are 55. But that notwithstanding, the question that has been raised is about decolonizing the mind, the book that was written by Kenya's Nguki Wathiongo. But even prior to that, Many people had interrogated the quality and the nature of education that was offered to men and women of color. The good honorable will remember as early as 1933. In the United States of America, Carter G. Woodson, having examined the education system in the United States of America, wrote a book which is a locus classicus, Miseducation of the Negro. And in that little book, he interrogates the education system that was in place, whose very essence was to make the Negro 
hate himself or herself unto like the master. So that I have no doubt in my mind, even here in the Gambia, when a warlord behaves very well and does things very well, we say that is the British. And this is a common thing in Africa. We hold the view that the things that are done well can only be done by other civilizations. I can't agree with you more that history does confirm to us that most of the civilizations that have realized monumental changes have done so in their languages. Whether you are talking about the Swedes or the Norwegians or the Danes or the Finns or the Spaniards or the Italians or the Dutch or the Koreans or the Vietnamese or the Chinese or the English or the Germans or the French or the Portuguese or the Russians or the Ukrainians or indeed any other community. Africa remains the only continent in the world that even as we speak now is still referred to as Anglophone Africa, Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa and even right now in places such as the Cameroons the battle is possibly between French, sorry, French speaking and English speaking. Yet, if you ask how many people in those countries speak French, perhaps only a small percentage. How many speak English? Perhaps only a small percentage. We are prisoners of a paradox. And that is why, as I speak to you now, the greatest desire of many young men is to run away to Europe. The Mediterranean Sea has become a graveyard for young men and women from this country, from Eritrea, from Nigeria, from the Senegal, this time round Africans are running to Europe to be enslaved. They are begging to be enslaved. How then shall we liberate that Africa? When in 1957, Ghana attained her independence. The Osage for Kwame Nukuruma said that the independence of Ghana did not mean anything unless the rest of Africa was free. A few years later, in 1963, in the month of May, when the Organization of African Unity was founded in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, there were 32 heads of states and government who sat there to celebrate the newly acquired independence. And each one of those individuals who spoke on that day were acutely aware that if Africa did not unite, Africa would be recolonized. There were two camps on that day. If you allow me to create two English words, there were the gradualists who took the view that Africa will unite gradually, that countries would enjoy their independence, and that in the fullness of time they would unite to form the United States of Africa. There was a single immediatist, that was Kwame Nukuruma. He was as eloquent as, and as passionate as one can be. He said, if we do not live here, with a united Africa with one army. If we do not live here with a united Africa with one currency, if we do not live here with an Africa with a united government, the neo-colonial project is real, alive and well, and within a short time we will be divided and we will not speak with one language. He was not a Jewish prophet nor related to one, but how right was he that no sooner had he spoken the specter of coup d'etats had started. But even prior to that, we know that the neo-colonial project had started in earnest. As early as 1960, there was already a coup d'etat in Togo, and Silvanus Olympio was eliminated, and Togo remains unstable today. Later, a year later, in 1961, Patrice Emery Lumumba was assassinated, and as we speak now, the Democratic Republic of Congo is neither democratic nor a republic, but is referred to as the Democratic Republic of Congo. That is the continent that we are speaking about. But yet it is also true that the problems of Africa have been analyzed for too long. We have lamented for too long about Africa. 
We have intellectualized for too long. There are many universities, including this university, that have courses that talk about Africa. The question is, will we continue to be prisoners and to suffer from the paralysis of analysis, or the time has come that we must now begin to look for solutions? My answer is, we cannot afford the luxury of pessimism. We must now begin to ask ourselves what it is that we can do to catapult Africa into an orbit where Donald Trump does not have to call her a shithole country. <laughs> so that the words of Donald Trump are not designed, in my view, to annoy us, so we should not respond. What we should do is to canalize our anger and to do the things which on the basis of evidence will make Donald Trump wrong. And that is what we must do. And if there is a generation that is going to achieve that, it is your generation. Oh, you do not know. But I have no doubt in my mind that Africa can only grow on the shoulders of our young people. About a month ago, I came across a South African, a young South African at the time that he was writing. He's a man who is seldom talked about. Pixley Kaisaka said, one of the founders of the African National Congress. And I read a speech that he delivered in the year 1906 at the University of Columbia in the United States of America titled The, the Regeneration of Africa. Pixley Kaisaka Seme was writing at age 25 or thereabouts. Young Africans were conscious even in those early days. In 1963, speaking in Accra, Ghana, Kwame Nukuruma made reference to Pixley Kaisaka Seme. I'm saying this to demonstrate to you that throughout history, young Africans have always made their contribution. If you look at the history of any African country, if it is South Africa, you will re recognize men and women who are in their 20s. How old was Walter Sisulu when he joined the struggle? How old was Albert Sister Lutuli when he joined the struggle? How old was Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe? How old was Oliver Tambo? How old was Tokyo Sekwale? How old was Steve Bantu Biko? In South Africa, when they were rising about against the apartheid regime in 1960 at the Sharpeville Massacre, in 1969 at the Sharpeville Massacre, and 1976 at the Soweto Massacre, it was young men and women who consciously rose and said, we must change our country, and the apartheid died. And it was not only in South Africa. If you go to Namibia, how old was Sam Nuyoma, or how old was Andimba Haman Toibo Ya Toibo when Swapo was fighting against the apartheid regime? If you move upstairs to Angola, how old was Agostino Nato? How old was Holden Roberto? How old was Jonas Malheiro Savimbi when they were fighting against the government of Antonio Di Spinola in Portugal? How old were they? They were in their twenties. You are Matthew Sellers, you who are 36 and still claiming that you are young. <laughs> and if you go down there to Mozambique, you must ask yourself, how old was Eduardo Mondlane? How old was Samora Moises Machel? And one can go on and on to Nyerere, to Kaunda, to Banda, to Lumumba, to Amadou Ahijo, to Namdi Azikiwe, to Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, to the Sodana of Sokoto, to Leopold Seda Sengo, to Sadauda Kairaba Jawara, to Ahmed Mentela, and all these. And you will discover that these were young men and women who were conscious that their countries could only grow by the sweat of the brow of their young men and women. Today, this continent, with a population of nearly 1.7 billion, Sometimes I suspect we could be two billion. The Ghanaians must have a census and the Nigerians so that we know how many they are. <laughs> the Ethiopians must also have a census and the Nigerians must have a census. <laughs> so that we know how many they are. I'm saying this because this continent cannot continue to afford the luxury of being the scum of the earth. 
we cannot afford the luxury, if it is a luxury at all, of being referred to in derogatory terms. We cannot sit back and allow our young men and women to be enslaved in Libya as they seek to go into Europe. We cannot allow our young men and women to engage in activities that undermine their well-being. What then must we do? Ali Mazurui, about whom you talked, several years ago did a major documentary about Africa. And he said, among other things, that the tragedy of Africa today is that Africa produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. And that is the tragedy of Africa. Africa must now produce what it consumes. And Africa must engage with other civilizations out of strength and on the basis of free trade. We talk about the democratization of Africa. Today, as I speak to you, if you look at Africa, Africa is not at ease. There are deaths taking place in the Cameroons. The international community is not bothered. There are deaths taking place in Central African Republic. The international community is not bothered. There is upheaval in Guinea-Bissau. The international community is not bothered. There is upheaval in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The international community is not bothered. There is upheaval in Burundi. There is unease in South Sudan. There is instability in Somalia. There is unease in Mali. There is unease in Niger. There is unease in Libya. Africa is not at ease. And history has demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number that when there is no peace, there can be no growth. Because no opportunities will be created for young men and women. But yet history has also demonstrated that countries have risen out of their ashes like the fabled phoenix and realized their potential on the back of young men. You know, many times when I think about the world and I read history, and I read people like Alexander the Great, the man was dying at age 33, which means that he must have started his activities at age 20. What are you doing at age 20? What are you doing at age 20? Why are you not conquering the world? And the world is not the world as we know it. The world is your immediate surrounding. What changes are you bringing about? History demonstrates to us that at critical times in the history of humanity, it is young men who have risen. In 1908 in Turkey, when they were changing the Turkish model and the emergence of took, it is the young men who rose up and we now talk of the young Turks. They were young and they were Turks. And Turkey has never been the same again. We remember in the 1917 in the Soviet Union when they were bringing forth the Bolshevik Revolution, there were young men who were in the forefront. When in the United States of America they were fighting against the civil rights movement, it was young men and women, Martin Luther King Jr. and other people who were marching in Montgomery, Alabama. And indeed in Cuba it was young Fidel Castro, young Raul Castro, young Ernesto Che Guevara who were involved in the struggle. And in Africa we know that those who are involved in the struggle, including in your own country, when they were fighting for independence in those early days, Dauda Kairaba Jawara was a young man. Where are today's young men? Where are the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies? Where are they? Where are the young men that are going to ensure that Africa sits at the table of civilization with other civilizations as a respected guest, not as a waiter waiting to serve others or as food waiting to be consumed? Where are they? This is what we are talking about here, that we must make a solemn vow. We must make a solemn vow that you young men are going to operate in the arena of politics so that you are able to educate and enlighten the people of the Gambia and by extension the people of Africa so that they can contribute meaningfully to the growth of the Gambia. I am gladdened 
that not so long ago, about one year to be exact, when one of your leaders conceded defeat and had a revelation of a very strange kind, that he had actually won and that he was confused. You, the young Gambians, rose, and when you rose, you brought about changes. Those changes are to be commended, but remember that democracy must be guarded by eternal vigilance. You can easily rule new it is therefore incumbent that you young men in a manner that is orderly and programmatic ensure that you keep the government on its toes. You must make sure that the government and the leaders remember that they are servants of the people, not lords of the people. John Adams, John Adams is still right. The only guarant of true success of a country is when it is led by laws, not by men. We do not want demigods in Africa. We have had enough demigods and those gods have not served as well. I look forward to the day that you young men will rise and ensure that our democracy is re-engineered so that it takes on board certain aspects that will make Africa great. I have no doubt in my mind that it can be done. I have no doubt in my mind that you young men and women who are studying in this university will not merely acquire sterile education but you'll acquire education that will allow you to invent and to innovate. It is sad that all the gadgets that I have here recording my voice, there is not one that is made in Ghana. There is not one that is made in the Gambia. The one that I see is Samsung that is made in Korea. The other one is Techno that is made in China. The other one that I see is Blackberry that is made in Canada. And the other one is Highway in China. I look forward to the day when I shall see mobile phones, one made in Senegal, the other one made in the Democratic Republic of Congo, another one made in Ghana, and another one made in Nigeria. It is only on that day that I shall know that we are one. We cannot afford the luxury of consuming everything. Even the butter that we consume in our hotels is possibly imported from Denmark. And that is why I hold the view that young people must be involved. And remember that nobody will involve you. You must get involved. Remember that those who seek never fail to find. Those who want things that are hidden under the bed must bend. It is only then that you can reach those goodies. If you do not, the old saying that says you cannot win the lottery unless you buy the ticket is still true. You must buy the lottery of human civilization and human development. That is when you can wait to have the winner announced. I have no doubt in my mind that you who are the university, you who are privileged lot, you must now go into rural Africa using the resources that you have acquired my own countryman Ngugi Wathiongo was right. Education that does not change your mind and heart is useless education. It is sterile. It is no different from the coat that you wear in the morning and remove in the evening. And I'm suggesting to you that good education must turn us inside out. I'm suggesting to you that it is the energy of the young men and women who must do that. In the recent past, I've seen countries rise, countries that we thought would never rise. I saw Korea rise in 1980. Today, Korea is in the business of producing every consumer good that we consume. I saw China rise after the Tiananmen Square. Today, China is the second largest economy in the world. I saw Japan rise, being bombed to the ground in 1940s. Today, Japan is the third strongest economy in the world. Germany was bombed to the ground in 1945. Today, Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world. Today, little countries such as Norway have sovereign funds that are in the trillions, and yet the economy of the entire Africa combined, the one billion of us, cannot even produce more than two trillion. What is it that we must do? We must wear a new spirit. The new spirit is a spirit that tells us that our problems are known. Africa is the home of the greatest resources in the world. Greg Mills, writing in his book, Why Africa is Poor and What Africans Can Do About It, suggests that Africa is the home of the greatest resources on earth. Whether it's solar, whether it is oil, whether it is hydroelectric power potential, 
whether it's arable land, Africa is and are. But the men and women that we have given the opportunity to govern us have never led us in the right direction. It would appear to me, if you allow me this biblical analogy, we were once before independence like the Israelites in Egypt. We thought that we had instructed Moses to take us into the promised land. What appears to happen is that the Pharaoh did actually change and appear to be Moses. And what he's been doing is to return us to Egypt to exploit us. We must now unmask those charlatans and ensure that we have men and women who are capable of leading us in the right direction. Remember that any society that does not pay regard to its youth is a society adrift, mm. a giant headed to the rocks. Mm. But the youth must also learn to make contribution, not with the arrogance and all-knowing approach that makes them inflame the, inflame the anger of the leaders, but they must act with the discipline and consciousness that opens their eyes. I'm submitting to you that that is what must be done. We can be the guarantors of our democracy. We can ensure that our judiciaries work. We can ensure that our legislatures work. We can ensure that our agriculture works. We can ensure that we eliminate disease. We can ensure that we are capable of doing things and creating jobs that are good for our young men and women. I believe when I look at you, even though it's dark now, even as I see the silhouettes of your faces, it is quite palpable that you have the ability to change Africa. Mm. Africa must change, Africa will change, but it will not change by dint of mere declarations. Mm. It will change if we roll up our sleeves, if we give meaning to Africa Agenda 2063 and make a solemn vow that we will be able to harness our resources, both human and natural, and make sure that we are crusaders for the right thing. We can do it, we must do it, because if we don't do it, we will be done by it. God bless you. Wow. One more, please. One more round of applause. Yes, bro. We can do it and we will do it. The young people of this country will do it. We will surely do it. Thank you very much, bro. That was exhilarating. That was really, really inspiring. Now it's time for question and answers. We have one mic here, then we'll be going around. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Culture is a weapon of liberation, as manifested in roots by Alex Haley, where Kunta Kinte resisted to be a culture, thereby rejected to be called Toby. Because if you lose your culture, you lose your identity, which leads to loss of dignity and sanity. Therefore, African youths need enlightenment in order for their minds not to be corrupted. However, there are a lot of right groups containing in contradiction to some of our African cultural ideas. My question is, does the African culture cater for the human rights issues which the right defenders are containing who are funded by their Western donors dictating to us which aspect of our culture is acceptable. Thank you. Uh, can you please uh, keep the question short, please? So it is Professor. No, you said short. Thank you very much. Perhaps uh, you will not see me, but it's better if I'm down. You know, you, you brought up a very important element. Those of you who have had the advantage of watching Alex Haley's, the dramatization of the life of Kunta Kinte, uh, 
and Kunta Kinte, of course, is depicted as having been taken from this country. Do they say the Jufri village, a Mandinka warrior? And if you look at the rendition of uh, that particular character, initially by Levi Barton and John Amos, one of the most painful things is when they want to change his name. And if you look at any of the holy books, whether it's the Bible or the Quran or Buddhist, the first thing that always you got a new name. You got a new name. Kunta Kinte becomes Toby. But deep inside him, Kunta Kinte does not die. Kunta Kinte is alive. The reason why I say that is to address this misnomer that African culture was frozen in time. That what our ancestors used to do in the 13th century, that is what constitutes our culture even today. Culture, and I have no doubt in my mind that there are quite a number of cultural practices that have evolved over time. If you go to countries such as Ghana, countries such as Nigeria, you countries such as Malawi and, uh, and Zambia, you still have the traditional shiftances, or even Uganda. But things have changed because they have interacted with other civilizations. And I have no doubt in my mind that if we dig deep into African cultures and give them a contemporary flavor, then they'll be able to accommodate the realities of today. And in that way, culture will play an important role in political and social development of Africa. There is a book that has been written by a Ghanaian traditional chief who is who is himself a professor of political science at the University of Cape Coast, Nana Kopina Kessie, in which she says, what is the role of culture in political and social development? And he argues, and I agree with him, that culture has a critical role to play in the development of any society. Of course, today, the NGOs are also making a contribution but there are certain NGOs who have an agenda which is informed by those who are their funders. Remember the old, age old English saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. We must be wary of such bodies. But it is through eternal vigilance that we will make our cultures have a pride of place. Lastly, I want to conclude that right now in many African countries, African languages are beginning to be given prominence at the lower level education system because this is informed by the realization that the Honorable Jata said that scientifically is now demonstrated that if you are Wolof and you understand and internalize Wolof, you'll be a better French or English or German speaker and you'll be able to handle the sciences even better and that is true whether you are Fulani or Mandinka or Ibibio or Yoruba or Ibo or Luo or Kamba or Luhia that is the direction in which we must move and the universities must play a role we must now begin to interrogate what is the role of the University of the Gambia in national development are you contributing or you are merely an ivory tower this is important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, next question, please. Where is Thank the mic? Thank you very much. Where is the mic? That's, that's the mic. All right, okay. All right. Professor Lumumba, my question will be on democracy. Because this democracy, as you always said, is puzzled out to Africa. And so Africa needs to look at democracy and borrow the good terms and implement it in order for Africa to develop. Don't you think the democracy that has been passed out to us and said to have started in Greece, direct democracy, then representational democracy, don't you think Africa needs to look at what interests it in this democracy that was passed to us in order for us to move ahead in order to achieve our development objectives? You know, one of the things that I find is that the European countries, uh, let me be direct about, the white man is very deliberate. They know what they want and they work at it consistently. 
the problem with Africans is that we are too trusting. We think that people always mean the best for us. That is not true. When the white man came here, we accommodated him and her, and ultimately they took over our land. Now, the Chinese are coming, and we are celebrating, and I'm sure in this university, I do not know whether you have a Confucius Institute. And even if there is not, they will build one. And all of us will be running to learn Mandarin, not Wolof, not Malinke. We want to be Chinese. The question is, even this thing called democracy, who says that America and Europe must tell us what democracy is? So that today, when we talk about democracy, democracy equals to multi-party states. If you don't have multi-party states, then there is no democracy. If you don't have periodic elections, then there is no democracy. In other words, what we have accepted and embraced as democracy is one that is doled out to us from the European capitals. And that is why Africans can't even function in it. One is elected as a leader of a country on the basis of the laws, and he swears to defend the Constitution, but the very first day that he or she occupies office, she thinks that the Constitution is an impediment. <laughs> and wants to go against the prescriptions of the Constitution. I am of the view that time has come that Africa must re-examine her governance systems, and I'm not going to use the word democracy. I'm talking about governance systems. Look at the Chinese. The Chinese have a system which works for them. Some may say it is dictatorial, but we are praising China. Why is it that they have been very slow to embrace Western-type democracy? Because they think it does not suit their society. Why is it that Saudi Arabia has chosen to go the way it has chosen to go? Why is it that the United Arab Emirates or Qatar or any or Kuwait have chosen to go in the direction that they move? Why is it that it's only the continent of Africa that is dictated to by European ambassadors? I'm sure when you are in this Gambia, the European ambassadors and the American ambassadors always think that they are prefects. When the president or any government official takes a route that they do not like, they say, America does not like that. <laughs> the president of Gambia does not exist to please America, for God's sake. The president of Gambia is serving the Gambian people. And you who are in the process of examining your constitution, time has come to examine that constitution in a manner that will be informed by the realities of Gambia. Yeah. It is not a simple debate. It is not one that lends itself to easy answers. But I think that is one that ought to be re-examined so that we are able to embrace uh, governance systems that will sustain us for the long haul. I think that is what it should be. I am suggesting that we terminate the question answers. In an African setting, you don't answer questions from people whose faces you cannot see. Okay. We'll take a final question, and then um, that's it. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sise. My question will go to Honorable Sidia Yata, the Member of Parliament for Wundi. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> right well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Honorable Jata. I understand that in Senegal, the House of Parliament in Senegal, members of Parliament are free to speak in the language that they understand. Yeah, so, much. Yeah. so I want to ask you, what is stopping the Gambian House of Parliament, in which you are a member, from passing a law that will allow members of Parliament to debate and speak freely in the language that they understand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. When I became a member of parliament in 1997, the first question I asked was precisely that. And the speaker's answer was that technically the chambers 
was not designed to enable that to happen. But the Constitution provides that we can speak any language on condition that we make it an act. Now, the question is, when are we going to make an act to enable uh, members of parliament to speak any language? Not only that, your law provides that we are all equal in this country. But the same law says, but you are not equal because if you cannot speak English, you cannot become a member of parliament, you cannot become a council. So this is the contradiction in the constitution, as the professor has just suggested. Since we are now reviewing our constitution to draft a new one, any one of you can face the commission and make suggestions. I, 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 I think that there will be some fundamental changes in the constitution that is going to come. But this is going to be one of them. And the other one will be on the issue of language. It will be more seriously tackled in the new constitution than it is in the current one. Have I answered your question? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, on. Hello? Can I get the mic? The professor has said that you don't take questions from faces that you cannot see because you are answering a devil's question. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes sense. Um, I think we'll, that was going to be the final question. Um, just to sum up today, I think three or four important things that we can take home. Um, one is that it's important for us to really, really revisit our education system perhaps to see whether we can start using our local languages as a medium of instruction because through this and only through this we can develop and i think the university has the role to play and sometimes it pains me that we are working on uh, like professor has said we are working on uh, establishing a confucius center that be sponsored by the chinese but we don't have a very strong linguistic center that can help us really develop our local languages, and I think that's a tragedy. Another thing also is, um, the professor has said that we have just gone through a very turbulent period, and now we've transitioned from dictatorship to democracy, but our democracy is still fragile. And I think to consolidate it, every one of us must be vigilant, so that we don't take a U-turn back to dictatorship. We must hold our leaders to account. Our leaders should be our servants, and we should not treat them as our God, as demigods. And finally, the role of young people, obviously. Everybody agrees, I think this has been discussed in many fora, that the young people are the future leaders of this country. Sometimes I even disagree with that statement. I think we are the leaders of today. We are not waiting for tomorrow. And I saw you, Prof, the next time you visit this country, young people will be running and governing this country in the greatness. I can promise you that. Um, yes, there are many last questions here. I don't know who to give the last question to. Uh, so... Uh, what? Um, yes, please, please. I, don't, I think um, we have to be very fair here. I think that the gentleman there who wanted the last question, I said no. Uh, the president of the city, you know, when the last question I said no, I will so keep mine short and brief. Yeah, but still, it's gonna be a last question, and I don't want to be very unfair here. Who is the question for? Uh, Mr. Jasha. Yes. Are you ready to take questions from dark faces? Yes. <laughs> I can come forward, no problem. All right, okay, cool. <laughs> yes, young man, come on. Um, Sidi Allah, you call me now. Your name, name. Kuma Fulala. Follow, follow. Walanko, Kurangumi met and told Domola, Mbalulu, Nanyato Kalman Keno Hanesai, 
kato kumi ya fanya meng ane interi tebe ya lonya meng ibuka tano nyato wandi kango kono nyato tewe wandi kango kono kuna fanko leta ano nyato akamuta fanga na kango leta ngado kuka nani ni karo manja papa wote kila watu juu mali aindi mimi professor hakato nde ni phone Probably there are many who don't understand Mandinka. And of course, our guest does not understand Mandinka. So I want to be fair to him and to the rest who don't understand Mandinka. I'll answer your question. I'll, I'll answer your question in English, and if you like, I'll, I'll answer it also in Mandinka. Professor, the question he has two questions. One is the ailment that has been destroying this the, the, the African continent economically. And even the mind of the African people is the use of foreign languages. When is that going to stop? And the, the second thing is, when are we going to be able to use our own languages as instruments for development? You know, as I said in my presentation, see, the first generation of politicians they did everything except one thing, which was crucial, and that is language. I have never, I have read in Kuruma, and I have discussed with him face to face, but I have never heard him talk about language. The only person, the only leader I have heard talk about language seriously, and even proved that African languages can be used to do anything, he translated a play in Shakespeare into Swahili, that is Julius Nyerere, President Julius Nyerere. He had thoughts about the use of African languages. And in fact, his thought about education became almost a model for UNESCO. They were promoting that, what he said. So I think what, what now he meant is all of us. This matter cannot be left to the government alone. All of us, particularly we who are in the university framework. We must begin to work to develop and promote the use of our languages. We must begin to work seriously and promote the development of our languages. When I became an MP, I started adult literacy classes. Somebody, my doctor, mentioned it. In 1997, I didn't have money, but I sacrificed my salary to conduct, and it's still there. The project is still going on, although I have very meager resources. But that has never deterred me to do what I can do with the little I have. So this is what everybody must begin to do. Because we can't do without our languages. We, in fact, we are delayed in development because of not using our language. Because we are not using the people without whom development can never take place. I say the development that we are talking about here is exclusive. The vast majority of people are outside the theater of that development because they are not participating in, in conceiving and implementing it. So it is not just government that must act. But all of us, we must begin to act and we must make it a force on your MPs. Your MPs matter. They can play a role. Because any, 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 any plan that is to be implemented in this country must be ratified by them. So they can be even, even begin to bring about the, a language policy that does not exist now. There is a sketchy thing about language in the new education policy. That's what I was talking to, telling the, the young man who asked the question. But this will have to change. Currently, Dr. I must inform you, Dr. Sisse, they are now implementing, it's now about three or four years, but do it is not very but they are implementing the policy of teaching the child for three years. But the problem with their system is that when you teach Mandinka now or Fulana, the next lesson is English. So that is not correct. 
that the fo big fault in their system. You should teach, teach the child the mother tongue for three good years. Now, in fact, the experiments have proven that even three years are not enough. In Ethiopia, it, they go up to four years teaching the child the mother tongue. And I'll tell you, doctor, I'm very lucky, extremely lucky. I started learning my language on the colonial system for two good years without learning English. For two good, that was an experiment. There was one in the Saraba, there was one in uh, 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 Bakadadi, and there was one in Badiakunda. I went to one in Badiakunda. So if the colonialists were able to inject that into the colonial system of education at that time, why can't we do that now? Now that we say that we are independent. Independent is not just flying national flags on car bonnets. <laughs> It is the ability to stand on your feet without begging and without borrowing. Just to add on to that, is it possible? Because we know that in the Gambia we have so many local languages. Um, it's going to be very a bit problematic, perhaps, if we want to implement this policy. Is it possible to create a common Gambian language? using the different languages as a, a cocktail of the different languages, yet still this language will still remain relevant. But thinking in the future to create a common Gambian language, that should be, this language will be the basis for this common Gambian language, to see how we can develop this. Is this possible? No. It is very possible. This is the, the argument of intellectuals hide behind to say oh this multilingual situation is not possible to take this to do that. So true. First we can implement the principle of a child learning the first language for three years. Currently what they are talking about, they're talking about area languages. And what they mean technically by area language is a language which is spoken by almost everybody in a particular area. This system, this problem is not peculiar to Africa. In Hungary, at a given time, there are 14 official languages. 14, depending on the region where you are. It has never hampered the development of Hungary. So what we can do is, giving the child the foundation to acquire a second language, we can see now we are not we are not using any policy, but if you if you find yourself in Bandi, what language do you speak? If you find yourself in Bikama, what language do you speak? If you can if if you can speak that particular language, you speak Mandinka. So people have no inhibition to speak another language where it is possible. I think what is hindering this development is you the intellectuals, you who have acquired English and you who are using that as a privileged position and you don't want to lose that. But I bet, I bet you, if you don't get yourself ready, you will render you all illiterate in your own language is very soon. <laughs> as far as my constituency is concerned, very soon I'll be sending people from there to teach people everywhere they come. So it is possible. It is just a question of organizing oneself. We can organize it. It is possible. I believe. Thank you. The question that I've been asked is about uh, what has been described as tribalism or ethnicity. It is not a uniquely Gambian problem. In my own country, in Kenya, we have political parties which call themselves political parties, but essentially they are ethnic groupings. <laughs> my view is that there is nothing wrong with ethnic groups. They are innocent. The only thing that we must fight against is mobilization on the basis of ethnicity as a means of excluding others and rejecting others. Otherwise, we ought to celebrate our diversity and use it to good effect. And how can it be done? If you acknowledge that there, is, there are different communities in the Gambia, then you accommodate them, then they don't go underground. So that as the good Honorable has said, you celebrate Wolof here in, uh, in, in, in uh, Banju, you celebrate Mandinka, you celebrate Fula elsewhere, 
And in the fullness of time, you'll discover that it doesn't matter which ethnic group he comes from or which one I come from. He doesn't know. Does he care where I come from? We are simply relating as human beings. Why is it that that becomes a factor, particularly when we want to give each other political office? And as Nyerere rightly said, ethnic mobilization is a tool that is used by bankrupt politicians who have no ideas to recruit members of their ethnic group. And immediately you liberate yourself from that kind of thinking then you'll be judging people on the basis of the content of their character, not on the basis of their ethnic extraction. And it is your generation. I hope that in this university you don't have organizations called the Wall of Organization or the Mandinka or the Fool. I hope you don't. That is a very good thing. Continue that way. Organize yourself as engineers, as lawyers, as journalists. That is what is important. And you build a Gambia which is diverse but unified. Thank you. Um, why is Alpha alone? Alpha. Alpha. Why are you ready? Thank you. 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 Um, that's it for today. Um, one final round of applause for his speakers, please. We have Fanta, uh, the Vice President of the Student Union of the University of Gambia, to give the closing remarks and the word of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Members of the high table. University of the Gambia students, guests present. My name is Fanta Fofana, the Vice President of the University of the Gambia Students Union and also a medical student. As I said earlier, my name is Fanta. So when the speakers were speaking, it came down to a point where I remembered something that happened to me uh, a few years back in, uh, during lectures. So a lecturer of mine came in and was asking each and every student's name. And I told him my name is Fanta. And the first thing they said, or he said was, Fanta the drink. I get this all the time. Everybody tells me Fanta the drink. Um, but this time I said, no, I won't accept it. And I told him, no, my name is not Fanta the drink. My name is Fanta. And he told me, where did it originally come from? And I told him it's an African name. So he told me, what does it mean? and I froze. I didn't know what to say again. Um, it's because every time our judgments have been clouded because we know that Fanta is only the drink. So everything else is, this, is different. If it's not the drink, it's not Fanta. So what I did was I did research and I looked up what Fanta means. And I realized it's actually an African name, Guinean origin in fact, which means beautiful day. So I went the next day in class and I told him that actually Fanta the Drink came up during the Second World War, which was in 1939 to 1945. And my name was there way before then. So I told him, in fact, my name, Fanta, is actually the original name. And the Fanta the Drink is German in origin and it has nothing to do with my name. And uh, this happens to us every day because our judgments have been clouded. So today, my job is the vote of thanks. Um, this event couldn't have happened at a better day, at a better time, and at this very place, the University of the Gambia. Um, I must confess that when uh, Mr. Jata, Honorable Sidia Jata, spoke about how we need to be unified as a people, we as young people are the future leaders, or should I say the leaders of today, then if we want to speak to the people that we want to lead, we can't talk to them in English, oh no. We have to say it in Mandinka. We have to say it in Wolof. We have to say it in Fula. We have to say it in Sarahule. We have to say it in Jola for the people out there to understand what we're saying or else we're not saying anything. So Honorable Jada, I thank you for that. 
And I must confess that University of the Gambia students are very persistent people. Now, when you made a promise that you would teach linguistics, Mr. Jata, Honorable Jata, we will hunt you, no matter how busy your schedule is. Today, we're talking about youth empowerment. I have to thank uh, Professor Lumumba for coming here today to talk to us, the youth, the future leaders, or should I say again, the leaders of today. Now, like I said earlier, it is timely. Because as University of the Gambia students, it is time for us today to reignite that fire we had back in December when the former president said he wasn't gonna leave. We stood and said, no. You accepted, you conceded defeat, and you have to leave. We have to reignite that fire. Because we need to see that we have a country where gov we have good governance. It is time where we check our system. We need to be the watchdogs of our system. And that's why I say today, Professor Lumumba, thank you for reigniting that fire. Because that fire has been reignited in me, and I'm sure each and every student here has that fire reignited in them. Do that. Sometimes we're working that fire.